So it is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Haynes, who is an art historian and curator based in Arizona and New York, uh, and who is uh, teaching art history at Arizona State University. Her research focuses on modern and contemporary art and architecture and histories and theories of museums, exhibitions, and the politics of display with a specialization in Israel, Palestine, and the Middle East. She received her PhD in art history from the Graduate Center uh, of the City University of New York in 2020. Her current book project uh, explores the role of art exhibitions in Israeli nation building from the founding of the state in 1948 to the establishment of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem in 1965. Her research has been supported by a Fulbright Fellowship, a New York Public Humanities Fellowship, and a Presidential Research Fellowship at the Center for the Humanities at CUNY's Graduate Center. Um, before I turn things over to Dr. Shields, um, thanks really to my colleague here in art history, uh, Abigail lapin uh, who very kindly uh, organized and orchestrated this event, and unfortunately isn't able to join us uh, this afternoon, but God willing, you know, we're trying to record this thing and she will be able to, uh, to uh, uh, listen to the talk later on. Um, and also sincere thanks to our friend Mark Friedman, who has uh, generously funded this event, uh, as well as other events that we are hosting here in the Center for Jewish Studies. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Chelsea Haynes. Thank you, Matthias, and to Abigail, who is not here, and, and everybody else who's invited me to give this talk, which is um, somewhat adjacent to a lot of the research that I've been doing, but has been um, a pretty fun exploration. Okay. So uh, the SS Shalom uh, sailed its maiden voyage from Haifa to New York in April 1964. But even before launching, the ocean liner had been touted as a testament to the Israeli national spirit. Constructed in the shipyards of Saint Nazaire, France, for 1,100 passengers in 362 cabins, the Shalom was not Israel's first liner, but it was by far its most opulent. Known as Israel's floating ambassadors, the ocean liners built by the National Shipping Company, SIM, in the 50s had played a special role in constructing a sense of national identity. The Shalom, however, represented a new era, reflecting a broadening sense of internationalism in Israel in the 60s as it sought to expand economically and make its mark in the booming luxury leisure industry. The Shalom's enormous size and state-of-the-art technology appealed to first-class passengers, while its Christian chapel signaled the Shalom's ambitions to compete with the major European and American ocean liners by expanding beyond Israel's existing tourist space among the Jewish diaspora. The advertising for the Shalom showcases the portended glamour of a new Israel. Sailing along its Haifa and Naples, New York route, the Shalom was not just a ship, but a sign of a new Israel. One of Sandy Beach's world-class entertainment and newly assured ease of international mobility. The Shalom was a harbinger of change in a country perhaps best known abroad at the time for its grit in the face of war. Embodied by figures like the fictional Ari Ben Kamen, portrayed by Paul Newman in the 1960 film adaptation of Exodus, a rugged kibbutznik soldier with a shovel in one hand, submachine gun in the other. At the 1947 standoff between the British Navy and the sailors and Holocaust refugees of the Exodus, dramatized in the film, became an international symbol of the determination of Jewish people to form a nation state. Less than two decades later, the Shalom signaled Israel's readiness to join the economic elite. 
This new Israel of the 60s embraced the concept of Yom Tikkun or Mediterraneanism. This new conception of Israel as an idyllic Mediterranean destination signified an attempt from Israel to connect with a regional identity, at least as much as it would ultimately serve national interests. This turn toward a Mediterranean identity was visualized nowhere more effectively than in the work of Dora Gad, who designed the interiors of the Shalom. One of the most prolific designers in Israel in the mid 20th century, Gad's role in establishing what came to be regarded as a quintessentially Israeli aesthetic is as central as her work remains under recognized today. Although trained as an architect and engineer, for the most part, God did not design buildings. This was largely left to the men who have been better remembered by historians. Instead, God's interior design work imbued her signature pared down yet warm take on the modern interior for existing and newly planned structures. Her work spanned almost every official government building from the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, uh, to the president's house in Jerusalem, to the embassies of the state of Israel in Washington, D.C. and Ankara, Turkey. God's work, um, however, moved well beyond these official government projects as she extended her vision of an Israeli aesthetic into the tourism sector, where she focused on designing interiors for the Hilton and Hasharon hotels in Israel, LL airplanes, terminals and offices, and the Zen cruise ships. Looking back, uh, rather nostalgically, the Israeli architectural historian Ron Shakari has noted, quote, how good it was to see our image through the mirror of her design. This lecture explores how this image of Israel reflected in God's interior, de interior designs of the 60s, focusing uh, particularly on her work in the emerging international tourism sector by examining the Shalom as well as the Hilton Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Moving across various registers of art, architecture, and design, a fuller analysis of God's work underscores the role of her aesthetic in Israel's cultural and commercial redefinition as a Mediterranean country and its ramifications for Israeli geopolitics in the 60s and beyond. A Romania-born Vienna-trained architect Dora Gott, born Dora Siegel, immigrated to British Mandate Palestine in 1936, following her fellow architect husband, Ezekiel Goldberg, to Tel Aviv. They were among the professionals who migrated to mandatory Palestine in the 30s to escape rising anti-Semitic fascism in Europe. Together, this new influx of immigrants forged a critical mass of trained architects and engineers who brought with them European modernist paradigms about architecture and design, replacing the somewhat idiosyncratic and fantastical structures of the first generation of Tel Aviv settlement with streamlined white pharaoh concrete structures later dubbed Tel Aviv Bauhaus. When she arrived in Tel Aviv, God worked for a time in the offices of the prominent, formerly Berlin-based architect Oscar Kaufmann. But as the Second World War broke out, building supplies became so scarce in Palestine that almost all new construction was halted. In a shrewd move, God quickly transitioned from proposing new buildings to working on existing interiors, establishing a new firm with her husband. She soon developed a reputation for modernism without ostentatiousness, a fitting aesthetic for her elite issue clientele in the 40s. Although she began working on domestic interiors for private clients, such as Malcolm Goldman's Jerusalem home, uh, pictured here, who was the president of the World Jewish Congress, God's career took a turn after she designed the home of Moshe Sharet, who was Israel's first foreign minister uh, and later became prime minister of Israel. Sharet convinced Dora and Ezekiel to Abrae's eyes, their last name, from Goldberg to God, and later provided the God's first large commissions for the embassies in Washington, D.C. and Ankara, before beginning their work for Sim, where they worked alongside the Israeli architects Alfred Mansfield, Arie Noy, and Munia Weintraub to outfit Israel's first fleet of ocean liners. The 
history and character of the shipping company SIM, Integrated Shipping Services, dovetails with that of the State of Israel. SIM was founded by a diverse group of merchants, British trained naval veterans, and sailors who had been smuggling arms, goods, and Jewish refugees to the shores of Palestine since the 30s. Formally registered as a company in 1945, SIM launched its first ship, a steamship known as the Kedma, in 1947. Seen here carrying Jewish Holocaust refugees from Marseille to Haifa in 1948. In its first year, SIM was primarily tasked with carrying Jewish refugees across the Mediterranean, mostly from British detention camps in Cyprus, but also from North Africa. Between 1948 and 1949 alone, SIM carried over 100,000 Holocaust refugees to Israel. Over time, SIM moved away from needs-based migration and toward the construction of a new tourism industry. The company moved from transporting immigrants to passengers, including upper and upper middle class Israelis and Jewish people living in Europe and North America, who were eager to visit the new state but not make it their new home. The shipping company's national importance was not limited to transporting people. After 1948, the new state had effectively become landlocked uh, in various states of war with all of its immediate neighbors. The sea was therefore its primary recourse to economic development through trade and in many cases, international travel. The state invested heavily in SIM and as part of the West German reparations agreement with Israel in 1950, SIM was allocated funds to commission 36 new ships that would increase Israel's international trade. Numbered among these ships were the transatlantic passenger liners, the interiors of which were initially to be designed by the same German team that would engineer the structure of the ships themselves. Yet disturbed by what they called the pseudo-oriental vision of Israel imagined through the interior design proposal, Zim turned to the gods uh, to imagine what a uh, specifically Israeli ocean liner may look like. Well, the gods worked together on the interiors for these first ocean liners, Ezekiel died in 1958, leaving the practice to Dora God alone. From 1956 to 1961, the interiors for eight new ships were designed including the SS Israel, Zion, Herzl, Jerusalem, and Boletet, which became known for their warm but pared down aesthetics, outfitted with richly colored fabrics, local woods, and curved vaulted spaces, along with commissioned artworks by Israeli artists. These early ocean liners, perhaps unsurprisingly, were oriented to an entirely Jewish clientele, outfitted with synagogues and offering exclusively kosher dining. The Shalom, however, was unlike earlier projects in many ways. A nearly three times the size and substantially more luxe than any of Zim's previous ocean liners, the Shalom made the case that Israel was struggling no more. By the 60s, the continual sense of the need for industrial and agricultural development that marked the pioneer generation had lifted along with Israel's unprecedented economic growth rate of 9.5% in 1965. Politically, while the secular center left Mapai party remained in control throughout the decade, its stalwart David Ben-Gurion retired from public life in 1963. And his departure moved Israelis away from Ben-Gurion's single-minded focus on state building. With the elimination of austerity measures, new markets emerge for upscale consumer items and for the tourism industry, led by the construction of the Shalom. The Shalom was almost identical in structure to other international ocean liners like the SS Rotterdam and the SS Canberra. It was the product of a team of French naval engineers under the supervision of Israeli architect Ben Kaplan who deployed what was then cutting edge design for transatlantic liners. These ships were distinguishable through their sleek all way to hull and long yacht-like prow made possible by pushing the engines toward the aft two thirds of the ship. Um, 
which we can see from the two slender funnels toward uh, the ship's after back. The ships held eight upper level decks, the uppermost four of which were dedicated to first class lounges and passenger cabins and given thematic names such as the Olive Branch Promenade. Both first class and tourist cabins were fitted with the newest technology with almost all cabins, including their own private bathrooms and telephone lines. And in first class color televisions, a luxury that only the wealthiest Israelis could afford at the time. In addition to lounges, dining halls, schools, and gyms, the ship included a salon, barber shop, movie theater, winter garden, daycare facilities, and more. These luxury cruise liners, like the new international hotel chain of Hilton's, were essentially all the same in program and form, regardless of which nation, state, private company, or combination thereof commissioned it. The ocean liner itself, had long served as a metaphor for modernity, its utilitarian design and promise of efficient, streamlined, and ergonomic mobility offered a wellspring of inspiration for artists and architects in the 20th century. In his 1923 treatise, Toward an Architecture, what is now perhaps the most canonical text of architectural modernism today, uh, Swiss architect Le Corbusier extolled the virtues of the ship deck of the SS Aquitania, noting that the ocean liner did not rely on historical styles that the architect believed would soon become obsolete, but instead expressed the unifying spatial effects of ergonomic engineering without reference to history or class, politics or place. The ocean liner became a prototype of sorts for Le Corbusier's concept of the house as a machine for living in, a new vision that would maximize a home's spatial efficiency and the human potential for development therein. This vision of modern living was effectively placeless, a utopia that would exist everywhere and nowhere at once. This architectural concept of the ocean liner is emblematic of an ideal placeless modernity resonates with the social effects of the ocean liner, which has frequently been described as a liminal place of freedom and a seemingly a political space of relaxation and leisure where norms and conventions on land no longer strictly need apply, at least for those above the steerage. It was not up to the container then, but the interior design of the Shalom to evoke a sense of its Israeliness imbuing the cruise ship with a sense of place, even or especially as it was a structure almost identical to others, located nowhere in particular, but designed to go anywhere. The interiors of the Shalom were primarily designed by Alfred Mansfeld and Dora Dodd. While Mansfeld designed the large corridors and entrance halls of the ship, God took charge of all of its cabins and social areas. It was an Israeli aesthetic importantly marked by a conspicuous lack of nationalistic imagery. God's colleague Mansfeld stated that the idea of the Shalom was to evoke a national Israeli ship, but to do so only in the most subtle and unobtrusive manner. God achieved this unobtrusive Israeliness in three ways, each evoking an abstracted concept of the Mediterranean. The first was to make each room as warm and bright as possible, pairing bright blues, greens, and yellows, capturing the feeling of the Mediterranean sun against the sea. Even though the Shalom was at the cutting edge of luxury cruise liner design with upper level glazed decks and larger than average windows, it could not completely do away with the low ceilings inducing the cramped feeling common to the cruise ship experience. God chose to outfit cabins in wood paneling and larger common spaces with pattern ceiling treatments that help mitigate their low slack feel. The second approach was a seamless combination of local materials and the cutting edge and international design. God worked frequently with the Israeli company Mesquite which was a textile and fashion house founded by Ruth Diane in 1954 to produce richly colored and patterned tapestries as window and floor treatments. The mesquite idea was simple, 
to turn traditional handiwork made by Jewish immigrants from the Middle East to North Africa into commercially successful commodities, building a sense of economic sustainability for these women and their families. The Mesquite project consisted of industrializing and to a certain extent redesigning these women's work for a range of modern uses from carpets and curtains to women's clothing with the broader goal to incorporate North African and Middle Eastern visual cultures into a modern Israeli aesthetic. An important but by no means unproblematic gesture of assimilation given the uneven access to resources and opportunities that these immigrants receive compared to their counterparts from Europe. God sought to highlight these works by Mesquite yet not slide into the potential pitch of manufactured authenticity that was a constant danger in projects of this nature. Aran Shekhari notes in general with reference to God's work that without God's personal involvement, these structures of the 60s, like the Shalom, would very probably have suffered from the quote, bullying vulgarity that marks so many projects of this kind. She balanced locally sourced tapestries and carpets with the warm modernism of Scandinavian furniture, which was in great demand amongst upper class clientele in Israel, as in much of the world at this time. As soon as import barriers were lifted by the Israeli government in the early 1960s, the design store Danish interiors opened in Tel Aviv to great fanfare. There, discerning Israelis could buy chairs like the ones seen in the Shalom's first class lounge. The now iconic Egan Swan chairs first produced by the Danish designer Arnie Jacobson in 1958, itself born out of the commission from the SAS Royal Copenhagen Hotel. Definitely mixing the local and the international, God's rooms lend a simultaneous sense of distinctiveness and ever-present comfort matching local fabrics with the purported transience of international modernist furniture. It was the third element, however, that made God stand apart from her peers and what made her projects particularly unique. Her extensive collaborations and commissions of contemporary visual artists. While she frequently worked with Israeli artists on earlier ships, with the Shalom, God commissioned several international artists including the Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo, who in 1962 had been celebrated in Israel with a large-scale retrospective that traveled across the country. Inspired by his visit, Tamayo produced two large-scale paintings and acted as murals, one an agrarian landscape alongside a large airplane, another a view of the Negev, the southern desert region. The paintings follow the artist's process, which were made by mixing sand into the paint itself, creating a textured surface that would materially evoke the place the artists attempt to represent. The works were made late in Tamayo's career when he was well known as a jet setting artist and was frequently commissioned for internationalist projects heralding world peace. These paintings for the Shalom were produced just before he painted Brotherhood which would later become a key work in the collection of the United Nations in New York. Tamayo was joined on the Shalom by the American artist Ben Sean, who produced a mosaic and tapestry piece for the lounge bar. For the indoor swimming pool, God invited the, Emmanuel paint, uh, the Italian painter Emmanuel Luzzatti to execute a mosaic in collaboration with the artist living in Ein Hod the colony founded by the Dada artist Marcel Yenko. Developing abstracted imagery related to the life of the biblical figure King Solomon, the mosaic's imagery and material juxtaposed with modern bathers exemplified Theodore Herzl's idea of Sion as the old new land without ever naming it directly. An article titled The Seagoing Gallery and the upscale British lifestyle magazine Tatler summarized the cumulative effect of these artworks on the Shalom, saying, quote, this is no floating art gallery. The art is not shoved down the passenger's throats, but it is there. 
in every public room in many of the cabins to be appreciated consciously or unconsciously. God's incorporation of art, and particularly murals in her interior designs, was an attempt to humanize the surrounding nameless and placeless architecture and operated as part of a wide international response to produce a synthesis of the arts during this period, as art historian Romy Bolan has charted in her book, Neural Nomad, which reflected a post-war mentality of hope for peace and prosperity. God relied on the language of modern art to create a sense of Israeliness without Israeli nationalism. By promoting the idea of Israel as a cultural rather than political idea, God circumvented more heavy-handed techniques that would have been more clearly seen as propaganda. This dovetailed with a broader notion in the post-war period of art, particularly modern art, as a transcultural form, one beyond borders, but never without borders. The clientele of the Shalom, that is wealthy Israeli, European, and American passengers, would be the ideal recipients of this notion. While art historians have tended to focus on World's Fairs Biennials and UNESCO-sponsored public works as the locations where the intersection of post-war art and cultural diplomacy can be seen, International waters also became unexpected sites for expressing national culture, even if guised in the framework of international leisure. Cruise liners had long commissioned artists to decorate their interiors, from the staircase of the Olympic uh, with panels carved by Charles Wilson, to the Grand Salon of the Normandy with murals by Jean Dunant. However, it was in this late period for the ocean liner, that is after the Second World War, that the modern engineering of the ocean liner was matched with modernist art and design in its interiors, enhancing the experience of modernity that the ocean liner uniquely expressed. It was perhaps unsurprisingly newer and less economically powerful countries with something to prove which sought to emphasize its modern and progressive character as a way of reflecting its national place in a new international world order. In this sense, the presentation of art in the Shalom could be compared with Argentina's SS de Peu, which held an exposition flotante in 1956 as it traveled from Australia to Indonesia and India to South Africa and a pleasure cruise for 250 privileged passengers with the time and money for a six month journey around the Southern Hemisphere. The exhibition itself did not include commissioned art, but rather contained 54 paintings by Argentinian artists that would later make up the basis of the collection of the Museo de Arte Moderno de Buenos Aires when it opened its doors in 1960 thus fulfilling the national goal of the international cruise. God's Mediterranean inspiration for her Israeli design aesthetic was not as intuitive in the early 60s as it might appear today. In fact, the Mediterranean occupied a somewhat peripheral place in the early Israeli imagination. Despite the country's extensive coastline, Early Israeli artists and architects were largely oriented toward the country's interior, settlements, kibbutzim, and of course Jerusalem, which reflected that society's robber settler mentality and its focus inward rather than outward, that is, toward national development. In the 30s, Zionist leaders had spoken explicitly about the need to keep an encroaching Levantism or Levantiniut at bay. The Levant, a geographical term used by Europeans from the 15th century onwards to describe the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, was seen as antithetical to the project of Zionism, which sought to build a new society protected from the outside. This was articulated in the construction of stockaded towers in the 30s, prefabricated fortified agricultural settlements built by the history group 
the Zionist trade union on Jewish settlements across Palestine. The Mediterranean as a concept, celebrating broader regionalism, presented an ideological problem with figures such as the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik warning that as the Hebrew city of Tel Aviv developed and grew closer to the edge of the sea, it would turn into, quote, a cultural crossbreed, neither Arab nor European, akin to neighboring cities like Alexandria and Beirut. Tel Aviv itself was in fact not originally intended to be a coastal city, but rather a Jewish enclave abutting the Palestinian port city of Jaffa. The city's original urban plan, uh, developed first by Richard Kaufman and later Patrick Geddes, aligned the city's avenues north-south, essentially ignoring the waterfront with the sandy residential Palestinian neighborhood, Manchia, providing a barrier that separated most of Tel Aviv from direct access to the sea. Despite these protestations and barriers, Arab and Arabic culture did, of course, informally influence Israeli culture from its beginnings through popular traditions and lived experiences. For example, linguistic historian Leora Halperin has discussed how Arabic, as well as Yiddish and other languages, shaped the development of the supposedly pure Hebrew language, thus complicating the Zionist mission of the negation of the diaspora. There was also an undeniable pull toward the Mediterranean even as Levant Miut spread as a pejorative. Over time, the Tel Aviv municipality expanded toward the beachfront, which indelibly shaped the city's character. Starting in 1914, Tel Avivians could arrive to the sea from Allenby Street, then known as Dera Kayam, or the path to the sea. In 1932, a regional trade fair was inaugurated in Tel Aviv, sponsored by the British government. Called the Levant Fair in English, it was widely advertised with the symbol of a flying camel, designed by Arya al-Hanani, a symbol, apparently, of the Middle East in motion. In 1936, in reaction to the closure of the Jaffa port during the first waves of Arab revolt, Tel Aviv opened its own harbor. Three years later, Yaakov Ben Sirah, the municipal engineer, oversaw the construction of Tel Aviv's first beachfront promenade. The beachfront quickly became one of, if not the primary place of public leisure for Tel Avivians. Yet Ben Sirah's plan ensured that the city ended before the beachfront began. It closed off opportunity for urban seaside development and ensured a clear boundary between the city with its social codes and the permissive zone of beach culture. Yet not all architects shared this need to separate new development from the sea and more broadly uh, regional surroundings. The architect Eric Mendelssohn, who lived in mandatory Palestine from 1935 to 1941, attempted to convince his fellow architects to look toward Palestinian vernacular traditions rather than European models. A co-founder of the short-lived European Mediterranean Academy, he believed that architecture could work toward what, in his words, was an open Middle East or a Semitic commonwealth. It was certainly an unrealistic if noble vision of Zionism's potential place in the Middle East as the 30s came to an end. After the Second World War, renewed academic accounts of the Mediterranean as a source of deep-rooted regional identity resonated in the national life of many countries bordering the sea and their ongoing strategies to forge their place in the region and more broadly internationally as new institutions like the United Nations sought to achieve lasting peace through tenets of economic development and shared definitions of humanism. Mediterraneanism, as it would be later called, helped new nations on the eastern edge of the sea, including nations like Israel and Egypt, align themselves with Greco-Roman humanism conjured by evocations of Mai Nostrum, R.C., uh, and dispel the otherness in relation to Europe of their respective Jewish and Islamic religious identity. 
However, the Mediterranean as both a historical construct and a keyword in the realm of modern cultural politics was always slippery and contingent and often revealed as much about the desires of those who deployed the term as about a given subject at hand. In more recent decades, particularly since the 1980s and early 90s, Mediterraneanism has been offered as an alternate mode of understanding Israeli identity with the Mediterranean seemingly offering an inclusive sense of Israeliness grounded in neither atavistic returns to origins nor settler colonialism, with Israelis as both neither Canaanites nor Crusaders in David Ohana and Alexandra Knox formulation. In Knox's book, The Place of the Mediterranean in Modern Israeli Identity, she argues that the Mediterranean offers a productive category that diffuses the constant polarization between Western cultural heritage and Oriental context by introducing a third model, one in which diverse positions converge and existing individual identities expand. The question remains, however, if Mediterraneanism in fact open diverse and expanding positions or if it in fact masked continued competing nationalisms and conflict. Understanding Mediterraneanism as a geopolitical strategy helps illuminate how, for example, Israel and Egypt, two countries at war with each other in the 50s and 60s, could simultaneously claim that their nation and implicitly not others had inherited the Mediterranean spirit in their respective cultural projects while simultaneously ignoring the tenets of regional affinity and tolerance that such evocations might conjure. In the 60s, evoking Mediterranean regionalism also helped Israeli architects and designers like Dora Gad align their work with international architectural movements led by European groups such as Team 10 who promoted a notion of critical regionalism in their work. Thus, the turn to the Mediterranean can also be read as a continued appeal to synchronize architecture and design with Europe and the United States. New Israeli design projects focused on Mediterranean aesthetics were also financially supported by Israel's increased diplomatic and economic appeals to international non-Jewish tourists and investors. This turn is exemplified in the Hilton Tel Aviv, which the Knesset pitched to the Hilton Hotel Corporation in 1960. The hotel opened in 1965, designed by Yaakov Rector, along with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, containing the Hilton tradition of the American firm collaborating with prominent local architects. They first worked uh, with famed Turkish architects, Sadat Hakia Dam, uh, for the Istanbul Hilton, which opened in 1955. The Tel Aviv Hilton generally follows the Hilton formula. A large horizontal slab with the lobby and guest services located on the ground floor and a tower above for guest rooms. For Hilton's international locations, local architects were invited to provide a twist to the standard program befitting local context. In Pelody, the brutalist building rests on massive piloti, opening the ground floor lobby to the beach. Rector's father, Zev, was credited for successfully adapting this design element, often associated with Le Corbusier, to the Israeli context. And in this building, Rector signals this paternal legacy and his awareness of current international developments in architecture. The Hilton is entirely oriented toward the Mediterranean, with each guest room angled 15 degrees to the west in order to offer an unobstructed sea view. In the hotel, certain areas were given historically significant and somewhat graceless names, such as King Solomon's Grill Room. A god, as interior designer, unsuccessfully petitioned to change that room's name, arguing
arguing that evoking the Israeli context should only be place based and not based on biblical or historical themes. God claimed her designs for the Hilton were inspired in part by the Negev, with carpets and tapestries and ochres of red, purple, and yellow, reflective ceilings, and shimmering beaded curtains that could open or close for private social functions. In the dining area, God juxtaposed Canaanite jars with a three panel mural by Israeli artist Dr. Karaman, consisting of boldly colored geometric forms, each an abstracted representation of wadis and canyons of the negative. The Hilton Colony was built on formerly public land. And like the government subsidized SS Shalom, there were controversies over the use of public funds to build up a leisure industry that most people could not enjoy. Furthermore, the building reor reoriented the city away from the Getty City Plan of the 20s and 30s, pretending the city's future unregulated urban sprawl. The government defended the project, declaring the growth of luxury tourism was just as important to the country's political future as its economy. The government hoped to turn a visit to Israel into support for the state leveraging the soft power of tourism for geopolitical gain. The latent geopolitics of international leisure became even more apparent in the construction of the Hilton Jerusalem, which was pitched to the Hilton International Corporation by the Knesset mere days following the Six Day War in 1967. The hotel opened in 1974 doubling the amount of first-class hotel accommodations in the city and providing shelter and amenities for international diplomats and businessmen. Like the Hilton Tel Aviv, it was a private hotel built on public land. The hotel, located at one of the highest elevations in West Jerusalem, had originally been earmarked in 1949 for a never constructed government building. While well, the Hilton Jerusalem was also designed by Yaakov Rector, along with Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, Rector departed from his Tel Aviv design to build a high-rise hotel that reflected new residential towers and construction across Jerusalem. The hotel consists of three identical towers united through a central core, all steel and concrete, but clad in city-mandated Jerusalem stone. Exterior balconies, rather than exposed to the surroundings, are tucked away in deep vaults. The rector replaced the open lobby of the Tel Aviv Hilton with a dark, low ceiling entrance area, similarly sealed off from the surrounding environment. If the Hilton Tel Aviv defied earlier Tel Aviv city planning to openly face the Mediterranean, the Hilton Jerusalem stands in it as an expression of defensive architecture in a newly unilaterally controlled city. Despite its shift in mood for the Hilton Jerusalem, God continued to seek out an interior design that would connect with its regional surroundings and celebrate the concept of a multi-ethnic shared Jerusalem, if not the significantly more fraught reality of Israel's new military conquest. God traveled the West Bank extensively, along with Ruth Diana of Muskie, commissioning Palestinian artisans to produce tapestries and metalwork. She also developed a repeating motif of circles, orbs, and bronze and golden spheres throughout the building, an oblique reference to the Dome of the Rock, by far the city's most distinctive landmark, which was itself originally intended as a monument to the three religions of the peoples of the book. God also collaborated again with Danny Caravan on the lobby. He produced three separate pieces. A large black orb placed at the center of a circle marked on the floor with inscriptions from the Psalms and Prophets, indicating sacred text shared among the three monotheistic religions. A copper triangle evoking a sundial jutting from a wall, symbolizing the city's long-standing character, and a sculptural relief, also in bronze, evoking the local topography. Yet Caravan's abstractions and sculpture remain somewhat unactivated in this hotel lobby. 
their meanings disperse and not as readily apparent as his other work placed in God's interiors. This period of the mid 60s in which God was her most prolific has been retroactively coined Pax Israeliana, with particular reference to God's work, hearkening to the ancient Pax Romana of imperial peace. Pax Israeliana was, in a sense, the subject of the Peace Pipe Lounge in the Shalom. The ship's smoking lounge, the Peace Pipe Lounge, was decorated with golden carpets and red couches paired with Ames brown leather executive chairs. A wood ceiling painted dark blue, along with scattered recess lighting, presumably above the night sky. On the walls, God had commissioned Donny Caravan to produce a series of floor to ceiling length panels, highlighting the shared culture of the Mediterranean. Working on paper in rich tones of purple, red, and blue, which were later coated in Formica, Caravan painted local flora and fauna and words of peace and friendship in Hebrew and Arabic. Caravan and God would later collaborate not just on the Hilton Jerusalem, but also on the interior of the Knesset, which was designed in 1966. Caravan's abstract relief sculpture of Wadis and Hills, titled Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem, has provided a backdrop for much of the parliamentary going on of the state since then. The phrase Pax Israeliana implies both serene control and a calm before a storm, evoking a sense of nostalgia for pre-1967 Israel, before the state's prolonged military incursions would polarize its internal political climate and international reputation. But of course, there never really was a Pax Israeliana, certainly not in the 60s, when Israel was conflict, locked in conflict with all of its neighbors. Recently, the design group Public School at the Holon Institute of Technology has used the phrase Pax Israeliana ironically to speak about this moment in the early 60s, which according to them, laid the foundation for Israel's post-1967 military strategies and territorial expansion. Like its Roman antecedent, if Pax Israeliana was a peace at all, it would ultimately be one achieved through effective military mobilization, political messaging, and territorial expansion. The sense of Mediterranean Israeli identity, pioneered by God's design, and the emerging market for luxury tourism in Israel was later deployed on a much larger scale by architects and urban planners in the aftermath of the Six Day War in 1967 to demonstrate Israel's authentic connection to the region, the purported regionalism of, Met of the Mediterranean, ultimately serving explicitly nationalist ends. As for the Shalom, it was Israel's dream ship yet one that in the words of art historian Gideon Pratt would one day become an Israeli Titanic. If the Shalom had a short life, um, it was unable to compete commercially uh, with other ocean liners. Despite its attempts at rebranding, it was continued to be perceived as a Jewish ship rather than an, inter in, an internationalist one, as the designers and Zim had intended which sparked a national debate in the Knesset about relaxing the ship's kosher dining rules and further marketing the Shalom to international tourists. The death knell for the Shalom, however, ultimately came not from the outside, but from its counterpart in the sky, al Israel's national airline. Increasingly cheap and fast direct airfare from Tel Aviv to New York spelled the end for the Shalom. It was sold to the German Atlantic Line in 1967, passed through several hands, and eventually sunk off the coast of South Africa in 2001, where it had been making its way to India to be broken down for scrap metal. Its ignominious end, a literal shipwreck at the metaphorical juncture of technological obsolescence and neoliberal globalization, could be interpreted as a fact does, as a doom symbol of Israel's pretensions of Mediterranean unity and peace. 
However, for God herself, as she managed to do throughout her career, she remarkably seemed to make the best of such paradigm shifts, always staying a step ahead of economic, political, and technological developments. Her practice progressed alongside the global tourist industry, transitioning from cruise liners to airplanes, by designing the interiors of the Israeli airline LL's fleet of Boeing 747s, as well as their offices in Brussels, Zurich, Amsterdam, and Bucharest. She designed the interiors for the new international terminals for Ben Gurion Airport, which opened in 1973, as well as the LL terminal at JFK in New York. Finally, in her late career in the 80s, spending significant time in Asia, designing interiors of new hotels and then emerging global hubs like Singapore. God's designs always seem to anticipate cultural, political, and economic shifts without fully embracing or fully being fully embraced by them. She evoked the Mediterranean in her work in the moments just before such rhetoric would be fully adopted by the state and architects working on its behalf. Yet God's designs did participate in a widespread geopolitical redefinition of Israel in the 60s through the commercial sector, transforming Israel's image from an economically deprived pioneer in society to the idea of a Mediterranean culture rich with the trappings of bourgeois leisure symbolized by the shalom. Ultimately, God's work marks the transition from the pejorative rejection of Levantism in the 30s to the celebratory Mediterraneanism of the 60s onward, underscoring the role of design in Israel's economic and political reorientation as a Mediterranean country. Thank you.